I think you have to go into a partnership thinking about what you can give through your partnerships rather than what you can get. And if people don't have that mentality, it's not worth trying to pursue that because you will just be in this transactional game that will never get to a deep connection relationship between the two organizations. Hey guys, welcome back to another Founder Podcast episode. We're here in the studio, blessed and humbled by Jean Olwang, and she is the founding CEO and president of Virgin Unite. So Jean, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you, Nathan, and I'm humbled to be here with you. You have such an incredible community of founders. It's, it's an honor. Thank you. And uh, Look, it's always awesome to do these interviews in person and you really just get to connect with the guest on a much more intimate level. So uh, the first question that I wanted to ask you is, how did you get your job? Okay, how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? Yeah, it was actually eavesdropping is how I got my job because <laughs> I, um, I happened to be working for Virgin at Virgin Mobile in Australia. And I was, at the time, Richard Branson, who was my boss, was on my board. So we were driving in a car and I overheard him talking about how he wanted to do more philanthropically. So I quickly ran home and wrote a plan on what Virgin could do. And then he called me um, and I remember standing in my little house in Roselle and he said, let's do this. So I hung up the phone and danced all around the house. And that was the beginning of Virgin Unite some 18 years ago now. Yeah, wow. And can you tell us, like, you wrote up this business plan. What did that original business plan say? And if you compare it to now, yeah, like, what was the difference? Very, very good question. So the original plan was thinking about we had at that time, I think we had about 25 big businesses in 15 different industries. So the original plan was how do we mobilize all the employees and all the businesses to really drive huge change in the world? And how do we build this kind of, I guess, connective tissue with communities that they worked in. Yes. And so that was the start. And we did that probably for the first, I would say, probably for the first five years. And then it grew into something that was bringing together these collectors of leaders and spinning them out to be independent. But always our roots were in the company. So it changed. Um, but now it's actually even better because it's almost embedded in who we are as a company. Yeah. And they're all non-for-profits just for the audience, right? So the companies, so in the very early stages, we were working with uh, all the Virgin companies, the for-profit companies, yes. to put purpose at the center. Yes. But the ones that we incubated and spun out are all not-for-profit. Got you. Yep. And how do you guys get the funding? So we get the funding from a few places. Um, one is Virgin Group. Yep. Um, they cover all of our overheads with the Branson family. Yes. And that way, 100% of what we bring in the door goes right back out the door again to projects. Yes. And other ways we do, we um, we have a social enterprise that we've created yes. where we bring entrepreneurs, founders, um, philanthropists on these journeys, these experiential opportunities where they can be in South Africa or India, all over the world to really be with the projects. And so through those, we've created this social enterprise that also creates funds to fund the projects. And then the third way is we just have this extraordinary community of people that help fund the different projects. Mm. So I want to talk more about the projects, but before we get to that, I want to talk about the earlier days, Jean. Like how did you end up working for Richard Branson? How did you end up, you know, being the was you you're the CEO of Virgin Active? No, no, it's Virgin Mobile. Virgin CEO, Mobile. Yeah, yeah. CEO of Virgin Mobile in Australia. How did you end up there? And you said offline that you were setting up mobile phone businesses all around the world. Tell us about that. Yeah, so for the first 18 years of my career, um, we would go into a country, and this was the Wild West, this was the early, early years of mobile. So we go into a country, work with partners, and help set up a mobile phone company. And so I'd be there usually from two to three years, and then we'd help get a local team on board, and then we'd go to the next one. Yes. And so I did that for a long time, and then I ended up here in Australia working for Optus, actually. And so I was at Optus for a bit and then went to work for the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And then when I was there, I got a call from Virgin and they said, would you come help us start up a mobile phone company? So that was my start into Virgin. Ah, and so you kicked off Virgin Mobile in Australia. 
yeah, with an amazing team. So I was first the marketing director in Virgin Mobile Australia, and then I became the co-CEO by the time I left to start Virgin Unite. Yeah, wow. And can you tell me about the experience of, I guess, working with Sir Richard Branson and what what that whole experience has been like? How often do you guys work together? Like, how, how does it all work? Yeah, and first, good on you for getting him on the front cover <laughs> yeah. of your magazine. That was early I days. I was like, well yeah. done. <laughs> yeah, that was early days. It's great. It's really yeah. good. Yeah, and it's been, you know, our first experience with each other was when we were launching Virgin Mobile. And um, he, he embellishes the story a bit, but what we decided to do is we were going to hang him from the largest helicopter we could find and um, fly him into Darling Harbor, land him on these cages to release our competitors' customers. And so that, he loves to tell the story about dangling and hanging in the air and coming into Darling Harbor over the bridge and then just shooting up and going over. Um, And I just remember being on the ground, being so nervous because we had not managed to get him insurance. Um, So I remember him kind of flying up and just screaming, I'm sorry, we didn't get you insurance. (laughs) So that was our first moment together. Um, and then after that, it's just been fantastic. I mean, he is an extraordinary leader. I, I'll never forget a, a lesson he taught me right in the beginning where we launched Virgin Mobile and the whole executive team was sitting in this boardroom waiting because he was there in town. And we couldn't find where he went and we were looking everywhere for him. And then we finally found that he was in the customer service center with headphones on listening to customers and talking to the customer service reps. And then he came up to meet us and he had a list of 20 things that we were doing wrong. Wow. And it was such an important lesson for me about A, deep listening, but B, who you listen to. Um, And he's just brilliant at that. He's brilliant at listening and learning and constantly being curious. And uh, and then also, obviously, just he thinks so big. You know, it's... um, it's one thing, he's just such, he, nothing, nothing is impossible and he hates the word no. And so he always is thinking about how we can do something rather than not do it. Mm. And one other thing I think that I have really learned from him is the importance of play and joy. Because mm. uh, I came from, you know, building mobile phone companies, you know, used to working from early morning, late at night. And so when I first started working with Richard, I'd come with these agendas like from eight in the morning to six at night. And he literally just ripped them up and we ended up on the gatherings we do. We have work from nine till noon and then the afternoons are for play so that people can get to know one another. Wow. That's crazy. So um, I'm curious. Okay, I've got to delve a little deeper here. So what what does play look like and getting to know people? what, What is the purpose there? Yeah, I think he really feels strongly and it's helped me understand how important this is that people get to know each other much better when they're in a place of joy and play like some of the gatherings we do would be at a place where people can go kite surfing or they can go sailing together, they can go running together, or biking together. So that sometimes is what play looks like, but sometimes we're in a place where that's not available and it's just literally going for a walk with someone or just taking time and playing a game of chess or just Mm -hmm. literally sitting and having a conversation. And I think that's the depth where you get really connected with people and build those partnerships Mm -hmm. in those moments of joy and play rather than just kind of PowerPoint after PowerPoint after PowerPoint um, and just people sitting in a dark room. Uh, that's the, play, the space where we've really seen stuff take off. Mm. So you overheard a conversation he was having and you built up the courage to write a business plan, which was end up being Virgin Unite. I'm curious, is that a common thing where he's constantly being pitched ideas or is that kind of environment very entrepreneurial, you know, saying yes to a lot of things, always wanting to say yes? And is is that common or? He, they call him Dr. Yes in the company. And uh, and he has to surround himself with people that will say no because he never says no. And uh, so now he's actually put some controls in place because for a while the group expanded way too big and we went into all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then we tightened a bit now. Um, But he's still someone that if he hears something he thinks is unacceptable, um, he'll be on the phone in a second saying, we need to do something about this. Like 
even like one time, I'll never forget, he was on a plane with this woman and she talked about this birthing condition that young women have in Nigeria where they lose their baby and they become incontinent. It's called fistula and thousands of young women have it. And so the next day he called me and he said, you're getting on a plane to Nigeria and we're going to get Natalie Imbruglio, the musician, on the plane with you. So literally within a week, I was in the tarmac <laughs> in Kano and Katsina in Nigeria. And we started a whole program around helping support young women with fistula. So he's constantly looking at ways he can tackle unacceptable issues and turn them upside down. Yeah, wow, that's crazy. So let's switch gears. You're, yeah. One of the reasons you're, you're here is you're on tour for your new book partnering uh can you tell us what compelled you to write that book and it's about forging the deep connections that make great things happen yeah and i mean this links to the conversation we're just having too because i think richard never does anything alone he always collaborates and realizes that he never has all the answers and so that as well has been a huge important lesson for me and we were starting this group called the elders um this is one of the first projects we started at virgin unite and incubating it. And I never forget Richard coming with a letter from Nelson Mandela that said, okay, I'm in, we're gonna start the elders. And it was an idea that Richard and Peter Gabriel had. And I remember getting that letter thinking, oh my God, I just quit this great job in Australia. I'm now working for a crazy man with a beard in London. And are we really gonna be able to do this? And we started it. And I remember sitting at the feet of the elders who were people like Nelson Mandela and Grasa and Archbishop Tutu and Kofi Annan and President Carter. It was an incredible group of 12 leaders. Oh, wow. And I'm thinking, how did they become who they were in this world? Like, how did they have these outsized legacies of impact? Mm -hmm. And what became really clear after watching them is that they became who they were because of each other and because of the partnerships they surrounded themselves with, whether it was the people they worked with, the people, their families, their friends. And so I kind of went on this mission 15 years ago to interview as many partnerships to find out how we can build these deep connections in our own lives that make us the best version of ourselves, but then how we take those deep connections and ladder them up to large scale collaborations. Mm, okay, so how do you first of all identify great potential partners? So we went on a mission and we were looking for two things. Um, one was they had to have longevity in their partnership. And then the second is that they had to use their partnership to have made a bigger difference in the world. So we found some that lots of people will know, like Ben and Jerry or Archbishop Tutu and Leah, but then tons of leaders from all over the world that people may not know, like Lester and Ray, who are fighting the death penalty every day in America. And then interviewed about 65 of them after we made that selection over those 15 years. And it was so beautiful because even though they were all different kinds of partnerships, friends or family, business, it was beautiful to see the common patterns that came up amongst all the partnerships. Mm. So you hear stories like some of these that you're talking about where a company from a commercial standpoint partners with another business and it's game changing for that business. Yeah. Um, if I talk from personal experience, I've always found partnerships incredibly difficult to bring to life you you know i remember one time there was uh we work famous we work before they became not so famous yeah uh, they wanted to do a big partnership with us and you know we were going to get the magazine digitally and you know as a gift to every single member and they had you know, oh, well, wow. well over like 50, 100,000 plus members all yeah. around the world. And it was when they raised a ton of money, they didn't have the bad press and all the stuff, the crazy stuff that happened next. And and uh, they were doing a lot of acquisitions, all sorts of things. And I remember I was talking to them and we're going up and back and they wanted to test it out and this and that. And it just never ended up going anywhere. And I've, I, that seems for me personally, when we try and do partnerships with other like-minded businesses that perhaps have a similar mission to us in terms of supporting entrepreneurs or or facilitating their growth in some way shape or form it just never comes to life and mm -hmm. I, i'd love to hear kind of what are the things that you see people and all, people that people often do wrong when it comes to partnerships or, or they don't come to life or what are things that people need to look for to be able to to find that that right 
Yeah, this is a super important question because I think even the great partnerships that we interviewed, it was super hard work. It wasn't easy. But I think the way some of them fail, there's a few things because we talked to tons of people to figure out why a partnership fails as well as why they're successful. And the things that came out are things like a lack of shared meaning. So if you don't have that kind of something bigger, that intoxicating purpose that you're headed towards, it's hard for the partnership to stay together, particularly in a business partnership or a collaboration. One of the other things was um, disconnected values. So you didn't have the same set of values and principles, yes. which is breaks up a partnership almost immediately. The other one was an imbalance in commitment. So if one partner really wants to do this and is all in and the other one's about, you know, maybe 50% in, it'll eventually crack because one will feel like they're putting in a lot more than the other one. And then two other things that came up. One was this kind of roller coaster of drama of, you know, it, some partnerships that come together that aren't supposed to be together. They just have this constant constant friction and conflict that they can't get through the other side of. And mm. you see that ha happen sometimes. And then the last one is something we call the superhero syndrome, where if one partner thinks they have all the right answers, they're the number one, then the other partner is going to tire of that over time. So those are some of the reasons we saw them break uh, rather than be successful. Mm. You talked about one which definitely rings true is, is that, you know, that mutually beneficial exchange in value creation. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking just of a partnership we tried again, like we've tried many times, and, <laughs> and there was one, I'm not going to say the company's name, it was. it is a well-known company. And, uh, oh, look, they were really kind of tit for tat around, you got to do this, we got to do that, and we did some stuff, and then it didn't do that well, and they did some stuff, and... And yeah, in the end, it was just like, you know what, like, let's just like, let's stop. Yeah. How do you find you get the right balance for that mutually beneficial exchange in value? And then, it, yeah, it felt like they were just trying to take as yeah. much as they could. Yeah, and that you shouldn't partner with them. It's just such a waste of energy then. You know, that's the other thing is really deciding who you, there's a continuum of you're going to have a lot of deep connection, deep partnerships on one side, and then a lot of, light touch acquaintances. And I think choosing who you invest your time in is so important. And I think it is that intoxicating something bigger that you have that kind of thing that you're both there for that gives you the kind of, I guess, strength and power to kind of push through some of the difficult moments when you're first figuring each other out. And I remember we merged um, the Carbon War Room, which was this entity we'd set up that was really about market-based models to reduce carbon. And then we came together with this science-based group that was more technology-based, which the gaps that we were missing, um, called Rocky Mountain Institute. So you had Richard Branson, the crazy entrepreneur, and then Amory Levins, the crazy scientist. And we merged those two organizations some um, 10 years ago now almost, maybe eight years ago. And in the beginning, the merged organizations were $15 million annually. Now they are over 200 million, 400 people. And they're doing amazing work with energy transformation, with mm. sector by sector, industries with business. And I think that's an example of where it really works, where you have complementary skills. You're not competing with each other. There's a, a real reason to come together because our ultimate goal was scaling the energy transformation. And, uh, and that has been an extraordinary partnership. But it wasn't easy. It was like we had to decide we were going to give up our brand in the early days, which was a tough thing. And it was a right decision. And then we had to figure out how we merged two incredible teams, which was also something we had to thoughtfully do. And then it was just figuring out what does that joint strategy look like? So I think there aren't a lot of mergers like that, particularly mm. in the not-for-profit sector, also sometimes in the business sector, because they are hard work and it takes a lot of effort. But my gosh, the other side of that has just been amazing. Mm. How do you know when to keep going? Because you said oftentimes that this can happen where it's kind of a bit rocky. Mm. How do you know if to keep going and keep pursuing or persisting with the partnership? Yeah, I think if you can't see a shared something bigger on the other side, something that's going to have tremendous impact if you come together as businesses, 
and if mismatch values like if you see respect not there in the beginning like equal respect as a partner um, and like when you're saying tit for tat that's not building a partnership that's more they were just trying to get from you what they could mm. and I think you have to go into a partnership thinking about what you can give through your partnerships rather than what you can get and if people don't have that mentality it's not worth trying to pursue that because you will just be in this transactional game that will never get to a deep connection relationship between the two organizations. Mm. Yeah, look, I love these stories because the idea of leverage can be so powerful when you think of partnership. Um, what advice would you give to our community of early stage startup founders that might be on the early stages of their business journey, perhaps hit product market fit, recently launched? Yeah. Um, using partnerships as a as a vehicle to move their business forward yeah i think a, a couple things um one would be think about as a founder do you want a co-founder um because like many of the people that we interviewed like ben and jerry or um you know joe nate and brian from airbnb um or the innocent drinks founders they all had two or three co-founders so i think that's the first thing to really think through like What's missing and who you are that you could get from someone else that could be you could multiply the the growth that you would have in your business, you know, tenfold just by starting there and also have more joy. And as you know, I mean, founding something is so hard. I mean, it's every day is so hard when you get up and having someone there with you on that journey just makes it even more joyful um, and gets you through those rough times because a lot of those co-founders talked about when one's down, the other one was up and they were able to bring each other back up again. So I think that's one place to start. I think the second is just thinking about your relationship with your employees. And you know, often we think about our teams as like numbers on spreadsheets and names on spreadsheets rather than as human beings and changing the way we lead of not bottom down leading, but how do you partner with your team and kind of shifting that mentality because that will make them Feel joint ownership with what you're building and creating and will make them want to work even harder for you and want to build something spectacular. And then I think it's also thinking about your board. Like that's such a crucial part of, a, of an organization when you're founding it. And I think we think a lot about like what skills someone's going to have or mm. are they well known or but very rarely do we think about what are the deep connections that people may already have on the board so that they start with that strong relationship of trust and respect? Because it just helps build the rest of the board and makes it even closer and tighter and makes it a more effective board. Mm. So when you talk about a board, how, how should a founder know when to set one up? Yeah, this is a very good question too. I have tended to be on the side whenever we've been starting our initiatives and founding something or even when we were building mobile phone companies in the early days yes. of setting up a board earlier rather than later, but setting up a more friendly board to begin with. Like an advisory. An advisory yeah. board. So yeah. you're not like spending Statutory, every second yeah, yeah. like responding to a board. and yeah. But you have a group there that's got your back yeah. and that's going to make you maybe think from a different perspective. And you're so tired when you're starting something, you know, you're just like slog. So how do you make sure there's people there that kind of lift you out of that slog to see that bigger picture? So I found that to be super helpful. And then as you grow, your board's going to evolve. You know, it's going to take on different shapes depending on what growth period you're in. Mm, interesting. And attracting board members? Yeah, which again comes down to that. Do you have that intoxicating bigger that people are going to want to run to, you know, is it an idea that you have to found your business that people are going to want to be part of and that you're going to have team members coming to, board members coming to? And then I think it's also just about going out and finding people who have built things before when you're founding something so they understand that early phase of building a business. And I found those people to be super helpful because they're also very empathetic mm -hmm. to where you're at. Um, and I also just think finding those people that also complement your skills. Because you can't, as a team, have everything in one team. So by using that board as kind of an extension, it helps you scale even more rapidly. Mm. So we've talked about partnerships from a commercial aspect and partnering with other businesses or, or individuals from a partnering standpoint, co-founders, board members. Is there anything else on 
the partnership side that you think would be really helpful for our community that we haven't discussed that yeah, you would like me to ask you? Yeah, for sure. I think partnering with customers and with your community is super important. So I think thinking about really listening, you know, there was a beautiful quote in one of the interviews I did where he talked about um, if, if someone doesn't listen to you, then it's like you don't exist. And so the most important thing is sitting and being in space with your customers. Like when we started Virgin Mobile, we used to have what we called V-dinners and we'd invite customers into our homes, our personal homes, wow. and cook dinner for them and have a conversation about what they thought of our product, how we could do better. And we got more insights from those V-dinners than we did from any formal market research. You know, it was just brilliant. So um, cool. Yeah, so it's thinking of them not just as customers that are gonna make you money, but how do you change that into relational so that you're building a relationship with them? And the same thing with communities, like what in your, who in your community needs your help as a company? And who can benefit from what you're offering to build that connective tissue into the community as well? Yeah, that's gold. Oh, we got to do that. Um, so when it comes to, I guess, uh, partnerships from a commercial perspective, what kind of ratio? Like, is it one in five you see work? Is it one in three? Is it one in ten? Because, like, yeah, I have to be honest, Gene, like, I'm... I'm a little jaded when it comes to commercial type partnerships. We've never been able to make them work. Yeah, and I'd say you're probably right. It's more in the end that fewer are working, but we have to question why that's happening. And I think part of it is because it's we're so driven um, from the time we are born, when we're in school, when we're in university, to be hyper individualistic. You know, we're so so driven mm. to be the one that we have to be the company that wins that we're so driven towards competition like that and i think that's what stops us from partnering because we think we can't open that door and that's what cracks a lot of the partnerships as well is that they come together and they're competing when they're trying to be a partnership so i think that mentality in the world is probably what breaks a lot of partnerships and i agree with you i think a lot of them blow up because people aren't at the table for the benefit of the other person or the other company. They're at the table more because they're thinking about how it will help them. And if people go in that way, then they're never gonna be able to build this kind of sense of mutuality. Mm. Um, and I think there's, in the world, I think there's this just huge lack of, of almost, I'd call it informed confidence or shared humility where people think they have everything that they need to be successful, but they don't see that by partnering. In, in, in any way, shape, or form it may be, like some of the most exciting stuff happening in companies right now too is employed, employee ownership you know, mm. of companies where your employees are really becoming partners in your organization. So I think we're moving towards stuff like that slowly, but we've been trained way over here. Mm. So I think probably many of the partners that you're trying to partner with have that sense of hyper-individualism where they're not really coming to the table with you with a sense of wanting to come together for something bigger. Yeah, look, from a employees, customers, community, I think we've done quite well in many areas, but yeah, just the commercial aspect, partnering with other businesses, it's never been able to work. Also, another thing that's been interesting on that journey is getting through the hoops. Yeah. Right? Because there's so many layers. Mm. What's your take there? Yeah, I think we need to look at why there's so many layers and what that what system is stopping that from happening. I mean, like when you say layers, are you talking about like how you merge the brand or the governance structures of the companies or the equity structures of the companies or at what level are you talking about? Oh, I'm saying layers when it comes to like, let's just say it's a big company like WeWork and there's one person, but then it has to be approved up here. Then you've got to do something yeah. with this person then this team here and then this team's got to get involved. And then next thing you know, you're on a you're on a call with ten people from your team and ten people from their team. That you, you, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I feel yeah, 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 yeah. I feel yeah, your pain from yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, and then it's just this huge big waste of time. And then you go yeah. up and back, you go up and back, and that's a, from my experience that seems like to be a consistent theme. But these companies that have great, it could be a great potential partnership from a leverage standpoint, no doubt about it, because. Yeah. 
you, you know, there's audience and there's there's mutually beneficial exchange in value. Like you see where I'm going with this, that that level of layers I find tends to be quite non-productive. Yeah. yeah. And maybe it's maybe you shouldn't partner with those big bureaucratic companies, you know? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe maybe that's the wrong question. Exactly. Like yeah. you have this gold dust that they're gonna want, right? Yeah. And yeah. but then you're gonna you have a smaller team. Yeah. So you're gonna have to spend tons of time with them and they have the gold dust, you have the gold dust they want. So maybe it's more finding who are the organizations that can move more rapidly alongside you rather than suffocating you. Because that's, you know, I, I've seen that again and again. You're right, that bureaucracy as a company gets really big. Um, you lose, you, you not just lose partnership with other organizations, you lose partnerships within the organization because it's so hard to get things done. And that's yes. when you start to see things like the finance team fighting with the marketing team and the legal team because it becomes so bureaucratic. And so I think you're right. I think that that bureaucracy is a killer of partnerships. Mm. So I think we've covered this, the six principles for meaningful partnering. Yeah, and these came up from all 65 of the partnerships. So it's not my wisdom, it's theirs. And um, we had all together with those partnerships about 1,500 years of partnership wisdom all together. Oh. And so we coded and analyzed all these thousands of pages of interviews that we did with them. And that's where the six degrees of connection came from. And they ran from that idea of something bigger, that intoxicating purpose, um, through the next one was something that they called all in. So it's learning how to hundred percent be all in and have the other partners back. Yeah. And then this beautiful ecosystem of virtues that were common throughout everything and trust, respect, belief came out at the top of that. But then there was also generosity, humility, and empathy. But then these really two interesting things that I hadn't expected when I went in to do the interviews. Um, one was this thing called magnetic moments where it was the place that the partnerships came to stay connected with each other. And that all kinds of like um, Airbnb had something they called elephants dead fish and vomit. You know, all, all the different partnerships have different modes of rituals and daily practices and traditions that they came together with. And then this last thing was this idea of celebrating friction. So none of them were void of friction, but they learned to disagree without being disagreeable. And they had these tools to help them lift above the drama. And then the last degree is just how you then take those deep connections and ladder them up to larger collaborations or companies or organizations to build successful organizations. Awesome. So look, there's definitely something here. If I, you know, I was, uh, I'm part of a group called YPO. Yeah, YPO is yeah, a great yeah, example of a community. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I was uh, on retreat last week and I was um, just sharing with the group and one thing that I was reflecting on is in my past as I've developed as a founder I think that I should have uh, partnered more with companies, individuals, people in many ways different di different shapes or form and I think um, I could have been able to build what we're building with founder faster so yeah. there's definitely, there is definitely something there, but I've had, and it's something I'm still working through and working through it now, is, is getting over this fear that what if it doesn't work? It's easier, it's easier to, to not partner because then you don't have that risk of it might not working or how, how do you unwind it if it doesn't work and these kinds of things. What, what would you say to that? I'd say ask yourself the question, what if it does work? And can you imagine what that possibility looks like if you came together with the right partner of the chance of scaling? And you're right, they're not all going to work. You know, you may have to figure out multiple partners, and, but you're, you're already learning. I mean, you don't want to work with someone big, bureaucratic, people that are going to try to take advantage of who you are as an organization and not come with a true sense of mutuality. So you already know you want to cut those out, cut that crap out, and then you need to Think about who are the ones that will help you scale um, because otherwise if you don't give it a chance then you're not going to get to like if you look at so many of the businesses organizations that have gone to scale have either partnered merged co-founders so the beauty in that partnering is if you get the right mix 
they add such value because they multiply what you can do by not just one or two, but by millions sometimes, depending on who the partner is. Mm, yeah, it can be massive. Like you hear so many stories, right? Yeah. And you've got at least 60, 60 of them in this incredible book, yeah. right? right? <laughs> They've been game changing. Uh, did you have any others that you wanted to share? Any, any, any that are really near and dear to your heart? Yeah, I think so many of them. I mean, I fell in love with these partnerships as I interviewed them. And people like the Ben and Jerry's of the world, you know, they their partnership was built. They weren't just building an ice cream business. They were building an ice cream business that was going to change the world. And that's why they were so successful, because they had that clear mission. And they had this clear, they talk a lot about trust and friendship at their core and their values. And that kind of permeated throughout their company. And I've never been, we were in a two hour interview and I've never been in an interview where the word love was mentioned so much between them and about their company, um, which was really, really beautiful. And it's kind of central to who they are. And I've also worked with them for 15 years and I've never seen them betray each other with a glance or body language that would undermine the other because they have such a deep respect. Yet they are so radically different because you have Ben on one side, who's the visionary, the creative, and then you have Jerry, who's the operations guy. But that's mm-hmm. exactly why it works because they complement each other. They're not trying to compete with each other. They're trying to compete to help it make each other better. And that's what made that partnership work. And it was such a beautiful one. And then you see these, like the Airbnb founders, um, Nate and Joe and Brian, you know, just really thoughtful about how they built trust in their organization because their whole business is really built on that virtue of trust. And you can see that trust that they have between each other um, because they work at that and they spend time together. But then they've also woven that principles of trust throughout their whole company. I mean, who would have dreamt that we would have allowed people to sleep in our homes and felt that we could trust that? Mm. And they created that and they created these safe spaces. I mentioned this ritual that they had, which was amazing, called Elephants, Dead Fish and Vomit, where they would get their team in a room and they would create that safe space to talk about the elephants that no one was talking about, the dead fish that were things that had been pushed in the corner and no one was addressing, talking about all the time but not addressing, and then the vomit that people just needed to get off their chest. And those kind of rituals help them build that deep trust within their company and their organization. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Thank you for sharing. I want to switch gears and talk about leadership. Yeah. So you've been a leader now for what, 30 plus years? I'm so old. I cannot even remember. (laughs) That's the one thing I thought when I landed in Australia. I was so happy to be here. And then I reflected and I thought, oh my God, we started Virgin Mobile like 23 years ago. <laughs> yeah, then you started your, your own business as well, as so yeah, setting up mobile phone companies. So, uh, so, okay, so conflict is a natural part of business. How do good leaders approach hard conversations? So this was one that I really had to learn because I think I shied away a lot from some of those hard conversations. So this is a really helpful thing for me to understand. And how these partnerships did it is they first created these safe spaces so that, like the one I just talked about with Airbnb, so that conflict didn't like continue to bubble and spike. And so they created that so they could have the the hard conversations constantly, which built the trust. And then when there was natural conflict, they created these tools. Um, Like, for example, one tool is that they would start a conversation with what if the other person is right? So you're coming into the space, not defensive, trying to prove your position, but instead really open. And then they also talked about things like the hard question game. This was the the Delhi brothers who started um, Tropical Palm Investments across the African continent. And one thing they did in their business is they would, if one of their three brothers that started it and their team, they would get in a room. And if one person had an idea that perhaps some of the others didn't agree with and they were all fighting about it, they would change positions and the other person would have to fight for that other person's idea. And so they called it with the hard question game. Um, And they also ended up putting in place an outside advisory board that would actually help make the final decision. So it wasn't one of the brothers, so they weren't put in an awkward position. So I think that's another tool that came up again and again is super clear roles and responsibilities. Um, Because if you don't have that, that's where the conflict starts. Um, And then they had really cool tips like Ben and Jerry's. 
they never, Ben and Jerry never wanted to let the conflict destroy their friendship. Mm -hmm. So they had something they called the veto card. So if one of them was super opposed to something and the other one really wanted to do it, they would they were able to raise the veto card. And they said they used it very infrequently. But when they did, it saved their friendship because they didn't let it destroy their business. Mm, so, so they had that mutual respect that if someone raises the veto card, they make the call. Yeah, yeah. So they don't have to fight about it and go back. Or be bitter, be bitter. Because, you, because you agreed that you can pull out that veto card. Yeah. Yeah. But that sparingly. Is. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about inspiring and motivating people? What advice do you have there? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with having that intoxicating purpose in your company because people will come to work feeling like they're part of something bigger and right, and it, it, you know, whatever that may be for your company, you may be building the best business to provide healthy food for people. You may be building the best car service company in the world that gives the best customer service. doesn't matter. But what is that intoxicating purpose that's really going to mobilize and, mo and motivate people to feel part of something bigger? And I think that's missing, Nathan, in the world so much. Like if you look at Gallup right now, that latest research study showed that 79% of people in the world come to work either miserable or they just simply hate their work. And so only 21% of people are excited when they come into work every day. So we have a real problem here. And I think part of it is because people don't feel like they have an opportunity to have also ownership over the work they do. They feel like they, again, are not doing something that's meaningful. They feel like the company doesn't really care for them. So I think all those things, like looking at the other side of that, how do you make sure you show you care for people? And I think that's one thing Virgin has done really, really well, and Richard has done so well, is always put his people first and made sure that, of course, they have the basics, but then that they also have the joy, the fun, but also each other in that relationship. Um, and so it encourages a sense of collaboration in a company rather than kind of individual silos. Um, and I think it's also mobilizing people around the incentive structures that you shape in a company. Like the Delhi brothers, um, every single person down to the person that cleans the windows in their company has shared ownership. Um, Harley Davidson just moved to share ownership. So I think there's also interesting things about how you make people truly feel part of it and have a voice in your company. Mm. Um, there's some of, the, some of the things at top of mind. And what about motivating others during times of adversity. In the past few years for entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, leaders, uh, it's been quite a changing environment. You take COVID, all the changes, now looming recession, or are we in a recession, all that. Mm. What advice do you have for leaders during leading during difficult times? Yeah, this is a super important question, and I'm smiling right now because I remember um, the first week of COVID, and I remember all of us just getting on a phone at Virgin because all of our companies blew up because we, every single one of them, had contact. So it was airplanes, it was cruises, it was gyms, it was hotels. So we all just sat on the call initially and just stared at each other thinking, where do we go from here? Um, and I think something really beautiful happened out of that, though, uh, where we left that call and we were all really clear the things we had to do. So we had a game plan. We knew leaving that call, OK, these are the five things each of us have to do. For example, all of the top execs have to take a salary cut immediately so we can try to keep as many employees on board as we possibly can. So that was number one. Um, second was, you know, how do you start looking at pivoting? Uh, your companies to make sure that you can continue generating revenue during this time. So that was number two. So we we all left and we felt like we were in it together. And I think that's really important for a leadership team is to stick together during that time of adversity because you need each other more than ever. And we found in that, I don't know if you found this here, but we found that we also became more vulnerable as human beings and we were much more open and transparent mm. than we had ever been before, which deepen the relationships that we had with each other and helped us keep going and keep each other going. 
Um, and I think it's becoming laser crystal clear on what are the few things you're going to do really well and not getting distracted. Um, as it was in COVID, you could get hundreds of distractions. You could have been on Zoom calls every day about different topics, but getting laser focused and then making sure that you're holding each other accountable to that. But I'd say also being really flexible and able to pivot and not getting freaked out when you're having to pivot and change. We were having to pivot and change every single week because something new was happening and we were trying to figure out what was happening. Um, so I think the teams and companies that I've seen be successful through this period have been super flexible and been able to pivot um, really quickly. Mm -hmm. And vulnerability during times like this, you don't want to scare people, but at the same time you want to be real with what is happening. Yeah. How did you guys approach this? How did you approach this? Yeah, and there's a fine line. There's a fine line here around um, vulnerability. And I think what we found worked the best is being transparent and honest about where we were, but never losing hope and never going into that mode of catastrophe. Mm. That's where you freak people out. And we didn't, you know, we never lost hope during all of that period. And we kept on knowing that we could get out the other side of it. And I think holding that space of hope but being really transparent and honest and taking people on the journey with you. Because I think if you're not transparent and honest and you try to hide from them mm. what's happening, all you're going to get are those back chats and people are going to be so focused on figuring out what's happening and wondering what's going to happen to them that they're not going to do the work and they're not going to stay together towards that ultimate goal. So I think it's a super clear plan, as much transparency and honesty, but not going into that place of, um, the opposite of hope, because um, then people give up. Mm. Was there any other questions that you would like me to ask you around leadership that I haven't asked you yet? I'd love to ask you about, uh, from a leadership perspective, have you found any partners in your career that you've learned from or experienced oh, great mentorship from? So many, <laughs> so many. Um, I've been very lucky along the journey with founder I've been able to surround myself with really great people. Um, you know, I've had mentors, some that I've paid a lot of money to over the years, <laughs> and then some that just wanted to help me because they could see that I had a fire in my belly. Uh, and then as time has gone on, I'm, I'm getting more into the, to partnering with others in, in all sorts of meaningful ways. So, uh, yeah, there, there's too many, Gene. I don't know. Oh, like, I can tell you one. All right, so when I... Um, I remember when I first started Founder, my family uh, don't come from a business background uh, or uh, not just my immediate family, but beyond my immediate family. So I didn't know anybody and I didn't have really any friends that had had businesses or had any kind of business acumen. Um, but I did remember that I met somebody, a friend of a friend who had a successful online business. So when I started Founder, literally within that first couple of weeks of launching, I added this guy on Facebook and I kept reaching out to him. And it took at least, I could see that on Facebook Messenger that he was seeing the messages, but he didn't respond. Mm. And it took at least four or five messages for him to catch up with me. And then I remember, um, you know, we still stay in touch since and his Co-founder actually is now my YPO forum. So it's a really small world. So then, we, that, and that's how I ended up getting into that forum and the forums are incredible. And, and it's just funny how things work out these certain ways. Uh, but that was a, you know, a great early mentor of mine, Jeremy. Or I remember in the first three, four months when I started Founder, the company that I was working at, Intrepid Travel, when we were mm -hmm. sued, we were sued for trademark infringement, so the mm. so the magazine wasn't called Founder, it was called something else. And I remember um, the CEO, the CEO and co-founder of Intrepid. I actually um, tapped him on the shoulder because I saw him get on the train, and it's a massive company. But he probably didn't remember me. But I showed him the magazine, and then a couple of weeks later, I got sued, and I said, "Hey, like, is there anything? I don't know what to do because I I got an email and this letter." to appear in Dallas, Texas, to appear in court. Oh my God. And uh, yeah, he, he, he helped me work through that. And he introduced me to another guy, another executive at the company who used to be a lawyer and 
he helped me work through it and write a letter. And mm. so, yeah, I've had some incredible, uh, you could say, people that I've um, had helped me or you could say partnered with uh, along the journey. And there's so many stories like that. So I've been very lucky. But uh, from a, when I talk about partnerships from a, uh, you could say, um, business or commercial perspective, I've kind of, yeah, I never could get that, but I'm being more open to it now. Mm, yeah, and and sounds like you already have great, I mean, YPO as well. I wrote about it in the book because I was just so impressed with the depth they go to in those communities. Oh. It's just an extraordinary community of people globally. I don't know, mm. how long have you been in YPO? Uh, about a year and a half now, yeah. but I used to be a member of EO. EO, yeah, yeah EO so, great too. Yeah, yeah, so I was a member of EO for five, six years. That was a great group as well. Yeah, they're great yeah. communities. Yeah, yeah. So um, we're going to switch gears one more time yeah. and we're going to move to the hot seat. Yep. Yeah. Rapid fire questions. All right. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Listen. What influential person have you met that you'd like to meet again? Oh, there's so many on this one. Um, let's see. Uh, Anthony Ray Hinton, who is, uh, was incarcerated incorrectly for 30 years on death row, came out and he's fighting to end the death penalty in America. Wow. Mm -hmm. What's something you've learnt today? I've learnt that partnerships on the commercial side can be difficult, but they're really worth it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. You, too much widget for me. <laughs> um, last question. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Hmm. Let's see. It would probably be Reid Hoffman, um, who I know you've interviewed for the, the podcast too, because I think he's one of the most extraordinary human beings from an entrepreneur perspective, but also just a unbelievable human. Mm. And then also last question, where's the best place people can find out more about yourself, your work and partnering, your latest book? So at Plus Wonder and then also pluswonder.org. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jean. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really enjoyed this conversation. And thank you for coming all the way down to our studio here in South Yarra, Melbourne. Great. Thank you, Nathan, for having me, really. And congratulations on what you've built. It's just amazing to see an organization that's supporting extraordinary entrepreneurs. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week, and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.